Our virtual walk explores some of the history surrounding the South Quay and its vicinity. While we conduct a much more detailed tour during the summer season, this virtual edition covers aspects we often do not have time to include. Our tour starts at what is colloquially known as the Stone Sofa, a sculpture erected in this small urban park in 2004, halfway down South Quay. Moving eastwards, we pass through Sackville Close and into Tollhouse Street, turning left to pass the Tollhouse itself, which is featured in a number of our virtual walks. Crossing Yarmouth Way and into Greyfriars Way, we stop at the Old Meeting Unitarian Church, before briefly visiting the Greyfriars Cloisters, and then walk up Row 84 into Howard Street South. Back down Row 72, finding ourselves at the back of the Town Hall. Now we turn right and onto Hall Plain itself viewing one of Yarmouth's most striking buildings, the Star Hotel, before crossing to the island outside the town hall and then onto the quay itself. Here we can get a good look at the wonderful thatched building on the other side of the river. Along here can be found the last drifter trawler, now a floating museum. Finally, we wend our way back to opposite our starting point imagining what the busy quay might have been like in times past. Visitors to the town seeing this sculpture from a distance think it is a case of fly tipping in the centre of town. However, it is together with two other major sculptural projects designed by Alison Aitken and Andrew Tanzer in what was a derelict space following the bombing of the town in 1943. The design of the garden retains the footprint of the original medieval rose. The scheme involving young offenders who helped to carve the stone sofa. Made of limestone, it stands at an angle in the line of the main path and has unfortunately suffered some vandalism since it was erected 16 years ago. Only one of the other two sculptural pieces survive from the project. A pair of swells, the herring baskets which were unique to Great Yarmouth, were cast in metal from replicas by a local basket maker, Terry Bensley. They were removed in 2015 and now can be found in the Time and Tide Museum, together with originals. The other is known as the Wish due to its resemblance to three wishbones. The steel wishbones or hooks are set within a circle facing inwards and are a reminder of the small Yarmouth fleet that used to go whaling off Spitsbergen, an island in the Arctic Circle in the 1630s. The Yarmouth industry was small in comparison with others and was soon abandoned given the distance and finance needed to maintain a viable industry. Next to the Wish is a small raised garden area, which is a memorial to those that fought with Admiral Nelson at the Battle of Copenhagen in 1801, and in particular his Danish enemy. Following the battle, Nelson addressed his message of truce to the brothers of Englishmen, the Danes saluting their gallantry during the battle. He was perhaps referring to the courage of 17-year-old Lieutenant Peter Willemos, who commanded a Danish floating battery with 24 cannon and around 150 men. During the battle, Willemos came into contact with Nelson's flagship, HMS Elephant, in the defensive line. He hooked onto the Elephant, which due to its size couldn't hit Willemose's ship lying too low in the water and as a result was able to fire many shots at the larger ship. His courage and good looks combined to make Willemose 
an instant celebrity throughout Europe. Locks of his curly hair became a fashion item among ladies in Copenhagen and he was praised in verse by poets and politicians. In the vicinity, visitors can also take a tour of the two row houses, should they wish to linger, now looked after by English heritage. Unfortunately, the Nelson Museum on South Quay itself is now closed and sadly missed as an attraction. We now walk through to Sackville Close and turn left when we reach Toll House Street. The Toll House, as the oldest civic building in Britain, can be seen on the left and the building's fascinating history is referred to on our other virtual walks, Sarah Martin and Witchcraft in particular. Cross Yarmouth Way and in front of you is what seems a modest modern building known as the Old Meeting. This building represents one of the longest tradition of a nonconformist congregation in the country dating back to 1642. The Reverend William Bridge, who is commemorated with a blue plaque on the building, came to Yarmouth in 1642, a period of tension between Charles I and Parliament that was to lead to civil war. Bridge is recognised as the founder of Unitarianism and his theological followers have met in a meeting house on this spot certainly since 1733. The building was destroyed by wartime bombing in 1941 and this building replaced it in 1954 but still retains the title Old Meeting. Walking to the other side of the building we find the remains of the medieval Franciscan friary, one of the many religious houses to be found in Yarmouth before Henry VIII's dissolution of the monasteries. The Greyfriars first arrived in England in 1224. They divided into two types, those that adhered strictly to the hermetic and life of poverty known as observants and those that ministered to the growing populations in cities and towns known as conventuals. The Yarmouth Friary was of this latter type and was probably founded in 1226. The friars survived through the generosity of those whom they ministered to, for they had no financial reserves of their own. Will showed that townsfolk make frequent small bequests, often accompanied by a request for internment in the church or churchyard. Many of the once powerful family of Falstaff were buried here. In the autumn of 1538, the friary was suppressed by Richard Ingworth, Thomas Cromwell's local enforcer, and possession was given to a Mr Millicent, a servant of Cromwell. The following year it was transferred to Cromwell's nephew, Sir Richard Williams. Much of the building would have been demolished or incorporated into dwellings, and all that remains of the medieval friary, that covered a wide area, can be seen here. Much of it was revealed following the destruction of the Rose in World War II. Turning to look east, we can see a conglomerate of new and old. The Gleaming Tower is one of the newest buildings in the centre of Yarmouth and is known as the Greyfriars Lighthouse, although no lighthouse originally stood here. Designed by architects Chaplin Farrant, it was built to join the buildings on Howard Street South with a former public house on Greyfriars Way. That former pub was the Ship Inn, a blue plaque on its wall tells us it was where Dutch prisoners were kept following the Battle of Camperdown in 1797. The commander of that battle was Admiral Adam Duncan, who we have met before in our Rhodes virtual walk and Galston Seafront and Quay. While Nelson's naval exploits during the French Revolutionary Wars feature greatly in Yarmouth's history, the importance of the action of the reserve fleet 
stationed at Yarmouth and made up of small, old and poorly maintained ships under his command have been largely overlooked. Here we should mention another young hero, that of 22-year-old Jack Crawford, serving on board the venerable Duncan's flagship. In the heat of the engagement, cannon fire broke the top part of the venerable's mast, and the admiral's standard fell to the deck. Jack darted out, seizing a marlin spike, climbed the rigging and nailed the flag to the mast. Hence the term, to nail your colours to the mast. He was acclaimed a national hero, and following an audience with George III, was given a silver medal by the people of his hometown, Sunderland, and a pension of £30 a year by a grateful nation. Walking east down row 84 beside the ship inn, we enter Howard Street South. This street was divided north and south by Regent Street in 1813, originally running as far as Church Square. This southern part was often referred to as Blind Middle Street, as it ended abruptly at Row 90. It was renamed Howard Street in 1813, after the Howard family, who had been Dukes of Norfolk, since Richard III's reign. Walking north, we turn back into row 72. On the northwest corner of this row lived William Haynes, a peruke maker, hence the name of the row. Perukes, or men's wigs, were a necessary and fashionable item for all gentlemen from the 17th to the early 19th century. It was made of long hair, often with curls on the side and drawn back at the nape of the neck. Use of the word peruke probably became widespread in the 16th century when the wearing of wigs amongst men became popular due to the fashion for men to have long hair. As one got older, then hair loss was an embarrassment. Another less savoury reason was due to the sexually transmitted disease syphilis. By 1580, the STD had become the worst epidemic to strike Europe since the Black Death. The outbreak sparked a surge in wig making, since one symptom was hair loss. Victims hid their baldness, as well as the bloody sores that scoured their faces, with wigs made of horse, goat or human hair. Perukes were also coated with powder, scented with lavender or orange to hide any aroma. Although common, wigs were not exactly stylish, but a shameful necessity for many. We are now on Hall Plain, named after the town hall in front of us. Looking back onto Greyfriars Way, we can see the old fire station that was once situated behind the town hall. Moving right to the corner of Hall Plain, Bank Plain and Regent Street, we get a good view of the Town Hall itself. The Town Hall is still the administrative heart of the town and was built in 1882. It replaced a smaller Georgian building built in 1713, but had become too cramped for the borough's needs. Within 18 months, however, it started to lean towards the river as the foundation sank on the softer ground. At one point it was thought they would have to demolish it, when Francis Duckham, a civil engineer, proposed to jack it up and made a concrete raft on which it now sits. Further along Bank Plain is the Star Hotel, with its gigantic star symbolising its importance to visitors for a couple of centuries at least. The original Star Hotel was actually next to the present building, being built in 1694 by William Crow as a two-storey merchant house. Crow, a bailiff of Yarmouth in 1594 
and 1606 was a member of the company of Spanish merchants. The ornate 17th century panelling of one of its rooms is now in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. At the time of its removal, it was regarded as probably the most elaborate specimen of late Tudor woodwork of its kind. But after it was purchased, experts reassessed the date to later. The building was demolished in the 1930s and the star moved next door, acquiring its mock Tudor facade. Now let's cross to the small triangle in front of the town hall on which an interesting and unique Yarmouth replica stands. The rows or narrow alleys running west to east across the town required a special cart to carry goods. Known as a troll cart, its design meant that the wheels were inside rather than on the outside of the axle, so it was narrower. This example is a replica but a genuine cart can be found in the Toll House Museum. Continuing across the lights and we reach the river side of Hall Plain. Opposite we see a thatched building. This is the last of two ice houses built by the Great Eastern Railway to ensure a plentiful supply of ice for the company's wagons transporting fish to London. Turntables near the river allowed trucks to be turned at right angles to run along that side of the quay. This building is the only large urban ice house left in the country. While some ice was cut from the frozen broads during the winter and transported by Wherry to Yarmouth, the majority came from Canada and transported in large blocks by ship. The size of the blocks ensured that the ambient temperature was cold enough to prevent significant loss. Talking of the herring industry, we now wander south along the river and come across YH89, the world's last surviving steam-powered herring drifter, although designed as a drifter trawler. Built of steel in 1930, for Galston owner Harry Eastick. She is named after his daughter. Constructed in King's Lynn, after her launch, she was towed to Yarmouth to be fitted out, fishing for both herring and white fish until 1938. When Eastick sold her to a company in North Wales, she was used as a range safety vessel under contract to the Air Ministry. Renamed the Watchmore, she did service in the war, but by 1969 was retired from the Navy. Three years later, she was bought by the Maritime Trust. Having been considerably altered, a great deal of work was needed to restore her to her original state. For a time she was displayed at St Catherine's Dock in London. But when the Maritime Trust ran into difficulties, she was brought back to Yarmouth in 1990 and taken over by a trust that also owns the Mini Carlo, a Lowestoft motor trawler. Taking almost 20 years to be fully restored, she now accepts visitors and often takes them out to sea to experience what work was like for Yarmouth fishermen. As we walk back towards our starting point, we can note the many fine houses along South Quay, once owned by some of the richest merchants in the world. But perhaps an in-depth investigation of who lived in these houses is best left for another walk. The Yarmouth Heritage Guides conduct a number of walks along the riverside and other areas, allowing you to take in the history and heritage of the town. Join us soon and find out more about the fascinating history of Yarmouth.